Hey guys, this is Mr. Swoveland. Hopefully everybody's having a good day. Um, I'm not in today, but I have a video lecture for today that you're gonna be working on. So there is an assignment in Canvas. If you guys go to modules, um, you can see there is a new assignment and they're under week three. It says Monday, 125 Thomas Jefferson lecture. If you go ahead and open that up, you'll see that there are a couple different things that you need to do today. Hopefully you've already done most of them. Um, just make sure that as we're going through this lecture, you are copying down the notes. So you do have a little bit of an assignment in there and you're just going to fill things in as I present them to you. Um, if you get lost or you need a little help, there's also a completed copy. So the copy that I'm working off inside of Canvas and you can click right here and that will open it up for you. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So um, just like the last two days when we were in class, we're continuing to talk about Thomas Jefferson this week. So we're gonna look at a couple key things about him and kind of his role in shaping the United States and the difference between him and um, the Federalists. So remember, Thomas Jefferson is a Democratic Republican, which is really the party of farmers. So they are the party of the individual landowner, of people who are a little bit closer to the earth and less likely to support things like industrialization and large cities. Thomas Jefferson also supported this thing called laissez-faire economics, which means that the government really does not have a role in regulating the economy. And we'll look at that a little bit more in depth. We're gonna look um, a little bit today at Lewis and Clark, who are two very famous explorers who went to explore after the United States made the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. The Louisiana Purchase was one of Thomas Jefferson's biggest accomplishments. It's going to more than double the size of the United States at the time, and it's gonna be really a big deal. So we're gonna look at that. We'll talk about the Embargo Act of 1807, which really did not work out very well. I don't know why anybody thought it would, but um, we'll take a look at that. And then finally, we'll talk about Marbury versus Madison, which is a very important Supreme Court case. All right, so let's stop, start off with laissez-faire economics. So um, when we think about the economy, we're talking about the entire country working together and kind of like the direction that we spend money, the direction that we make money. And we're looking at kind of how the government involves itself in the economy. So today we do have the government involved in the economy in some ways. Um, they are involved with what we call the Federal Reserve. So by doing things by like loaning money out to people, they're involved in some ways in protecting workplace safety through the OSHA, which is the Occupational Health and Safety Administration although they're pretty limited in their involvement, and they do some other stuff. During this time period though, when Thomas Jefferson is coming into power, this new economic theory called laissez-faire economics comes into being. So let's all say that together, because it's kind of a weird word. I think it's Swedish or French, laissez-faire. So laissez-faire means to leave alone. And really what this is advocating for is that the government should not be involved in the economy. They really believe that the economy can regulate itself through things like supply and demand. And it's just like a natural process. The economy will kind of take care of itself, workers will be okay, and people will be able to generate money. So people at the time are kind of saying that this is protecting the rights of citizens. That's like the only job that the government has. And beyond that, the government really shouldn't do much. And this very much plays into Thomas Jefferson's and the Democratic Republicans' beliefs about a very limited or small government. Remember, Thomas Jefferson doesn't believe that the government should be very involved in stuff. He kind of takes more of a hands-off approach. He wants to have a very strict interpretation of the Constitution, so defined powers for the federal government. And kind of he wants to limit the amount of authority that the government has. So what laissez-faire economics is saying about the government, the government should be, the government, the role of government should be to reduce its budget, so try and spend less money, reduce the size of the government, so try and have less people working in the government, make the military smaller, and then individually in the United States to repeal the whiskey tax. So what this is all based on is free market economics, or what some people call free enterprise. And in a free market, um, goods and services are exchanged with very little regulation. 
So this is an economic theory that has come and gone. It's something that actually people believe in a lot right now. Um, we've seen kind of some of the negative effects of laissez-faire economics now, but it's something that was very popular then. Um, and it's going to be something pushed by Thomas Jefferson. All right, the next big thing that's really going to happen during Thomas Jefferson's presidency is the Louisiana Purchase. So Spain is controlling um, New Orleans. Or this is we're talking about around 1800. So you can see down here in the orange, this large area is New Spain. And we learned a lot about that last year in seventh grade history, right? So this is the area where Texas is still part of. Um, Mexico controls. Mexico is down here. And Mexico is controlled by Spain until the Mexican Revolution, which is going to come about um, 10 years after this. So in 1800, Spain signed a treaty giving Louisiana back to France. Um, this was, there were a lot of fighting going on in Europe, and this was one of the concessions that they made at the time. France, though, is really struggling financially. Remember, we mentioned that Napoleon Bonaparte is on this massive war throughout Europe at this time, and he's trying to um, kind of take over much of Europe. And he's, he's honestly, he's being pretty successful at it. He's going to conquer most of the known world. He's one of the few historic figures that can actually say that, kind of like Alexander the Great or Caesar or Genghis Khan. Napoleon's one of those guys, kind of really is able to conquer much of the known world during his lifetime. But just like we saw with the American Revolution, whenever you fight a war, you run out of money pretty quickly. And Napoleon is running out of money. So he is looking at this Louisiana purchase as a way to make money. But there's something that really important happens in between. So Napoleon believed that Louisiana was, could be a successful place for France. They were making a lot of money with um, the fur trade. So beaver hats in particular were very popular in Europe and people paid a lot of money for them. And France was making a ton of money off of this. But down in Haiti, which is our modern Haiti, which is another French possession at this time, there happens to have a large um, slave rebellion. And this slave rebellion is not going to be able to put, be put down. They're going to pretty quickly overwhelm the French, and the French are not going to be able to retake the island despite their best attempts. And this is kind of going to be a big problem for Napoleon because this was his foothold in North America. It's where France had large military bases. They were able to send their troops and then use that foothold to really control areas in the Louisiana Territory. So after France has lost Haiti, after the slave rebellion is successful, um, and the people of Haiti set up a new government under like new leadership. All these the previous slaves are now free, and they're going to set up the first um, post-slave nation in Haiti, I guess you would call it. After Napoleon loses this territory, he realizes that he's really not going to be able to continue to hold on to the Louisiana territory successfully. And so he is going to look to sell it. So France is going to look to the United States, who um, Monroe is over in France at the time, and Napoleon and his advisors are going to make this offer to him. And they're going to end up selling this massive amount of territory in 1803 to the United States for about $15 million. Um, I looked it up the other day. I think it's the equivalent of about $400 million today. So this is really a good deal. Could you imagine buying half the territory of the United States for $400 million? bucks? And what's even crazier is the United States only paid them half of that amount because France owed the United States a bunch of money. So they only ended up really paying about $7.5 million for the Louisiana Territory. So instantly, the Louisiana Territory is going to double the size of the continental United States. And this really plays into that thing we talked about last year called Manifest Destiny. As the United States is exploding with population, people are moving westward. Remember, most of the United States is focused over, let me see, over here at the beginning, right? And then as we start to de develop, we're, people are pushing more and more out into what's called the Ohio River Valley, down to the Mississippi River and coming down to New Orleans. And this is all important territory. And it's important for a couple of reasons. 
not only do we need new land for farmers, right? So the average person family during this time period is having eight children and that's great. But then if you're going to continue this idea of everybody being a farmer, all eight of those kids, or at least all of the men are going to need new land to settle on as they want to start having their family for themselves. And this relentless push of population growth is going to drive the United States to acquire more territory. We really need more and more land for people to live on to have these big families continue. There's a second really important thing also going in here, and that is the Mississippi River Valley. So like I mentioned, this territory up in here, the Ohio River Valley, is going to be very important for the development of farming and people living on farms in the United States. And the majority of their products end up getting shipped down the Mississippi River to New Orleans, which then is shipped off to Europe. So this port of New Orleans also becomes extremely important to the United States as they develop as a country. It's one of the largest ports in the world at this time, and it's exporting a huge amount of cotton overseas, primarily to England, which has a very large textile manufacturing um, industry. Some of it is also getting sent back up to the northeastern United States, where there is also another large manufacturing industry. And so those are some of the reasons why the Louisiana Purchase is so important. So one of the things that really happens during this is, remember, Jefferson is a Democratic Republican or Republican. And he is really believes in a strict interpretation of the Constitution. So he's not really sure if he has the power to make these purchases. So the Constitution doesn't say anything about having the ability to buy more land. There is no specific power given to an individual for that. And Thomas Jefferson really believes in this strict interpretation of the Constitution. But he's going to hear about this deal in Louisiana, in the Louisiana Purchase, and he's, it's just too good of a deal to pass up. So he's going to end up making this purchase. And he basically says, we'll figure out the Constitution later. We'll figure out how we're going to make this legal later. So it, this is going to end up doubling the size of the United States, like I said um, before. And it's also going to give the United States control of the Mississippi River, which is a major trade route for all, all of these agricultural products that are produced both in the Ohio River Valley and in um, the Mississippi River Valley as well. All right, so after Thomas Jefferson, oh, I'm gonna, that was awkward. I thought I had to sneeze. Okay, so after, after Thomas Jefferson has made this huge purchase in 1803, he needs to figure out what's there, right? And the French don't know. Nobody really knows what is westward in the United States at this point. They're not sure. Some people even still think this Northwest Passage, right, like that water route to Asia exists in the United States. People aren't really sure if that might still be there. And they don't know who lives out there. They don't know what the land looks like. And so Thomas Jefferson is going to hire these two guys, William Clark and Meriwether Lewis, to mount an expedition or kind of a journey into this unknown territory. So Jefferson is going to ask Lewis and Clark to go out into this territory and kind of map a route to the Pacific. They're going to spend a couple of years doing this, and they're really going to spend a lot of that time studying geography, looking at the climate, and they're going to learn about some of the Native Americans on the way. All right. We also, at this time, are having a lot of problems out in the ocean, specifically in the Atlantic. We have a lot of fighting with pirates. You can see the Barbary pirates on the right. And pirates were really a very common part of the United States. Um, it, the United States, a lot of the early colonial economy was actually based on trading with pirates. So we did a lot of, there were a lot of American pirates too. But so, so we have a long history with pirates. But during the war between Britain and France, the British and the French navies are going to capture a lot of U.S. merchant ships. And we've talked about this before, right? This is that impressment where people in these militaries in the French and British Navy are going to go out and they're going to capture these American sailors and make them work for them. So they're going to make them come and start being part of the French or the British Navy. 
And this was something that was very common. It had been going on for hundreds of years. It's kind of like if you were a pirate and you ran out of people, maybe because too many of them died, what often happened is you went and found another ship and you asked, hey, does anybody want to be a pirate with me? And a couple people always said yes. And if there weren't enough, then you just took some more. I mean, these aren't really like the nicest people, right? So this is continuing on and about the British and the French are doing it, but it's very upsetting to people back home in the United States. So Thomas Jefferson is going to have a reaction to this that really it doesn't work out very well. So he's going to pass what's called the Embargo Act of 1807. An embargo is a ban on trade. And Thomas Jefferson is thinks that if he bans trade with all of Europe, he can stop all of these American sailors from being kidnapped or impressed into the French and British navies. So he's going to cut off trade with all foreign nations because he wants to hurt these European economies. He wants to hurt the British and the French economies. But really, if you look at this with a little bit of common sense, right, Europe is a much, much larger economy at this point. And the United States is a small country that is just getting started. And we produce a lot of stuff that you have to export, like cotton and agricultural products. We're not yet a country that's really producing a lot of industrialized goods. So this Embargo Act of 1807 does not really hurt any of the British or the French economies, but it devastates the economy back in the United States. They, people back in the United States are having a very hard time. There's tons of money is being lost, people are out of work, and it's really something that's it's not working out very well. Merchants are also just, they're just going to smuggle, right? The United States, as we've done this for a long time, we did it during the War of Revolution, and so if you're going to say we can't trade with anyone, then the United States is just going to come in and they're going to move around your system and they're going to figure out a way to get goods in through smuggling. So Jefferson is going to end up declaring no trade between Great Britain and France. It's called the Non-Intercourse Act. And whoever stops seizing our ships first will get to trade with us again. So that's kind of his logic. But it ends up being a very, very unpopular part of Jefferson's administration because it does so much damage to the United States economy. It does not really do what he's hoping to do, which is hurt the British and the French economies. This is a little um, political cartoon about it. All right, so today we looked at some of the stuff. Um, we looked at a couple of things. I'm not going to go back over them. But now you guys can go and watch this um, Thomas Jefferson crash course. It's also located in Canvas. Um, please make sure that you've completed those notes. And I will see you guys tomorrow.